Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Great panel ahead with some fine retailers. You'll recognize anchors of the roundtable, Tully Williams from the Nilo Company out in Sacramento, California, Sean Kingry with the Kaiser Automotive Group in beautiful, sunny Madison, Wisconsin. We'd like to welcome today Nikhil Kalani, who's the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Reynolds & Reynolds, and Brad Holton, who is the founder of Proton Dealership IT Cybersecurity. Gentlemen, welcome to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. All right, I think our audience probably has an idea, Tully, of uh, the topic uh, that we have coming. Tully, I want to go back to just a few months ago. This summer, I believe it was in mid-June, you and I were talking on the phone. And uh, tell us about the shutdown, what happened as part of a cybersecurity incident, and um, how you and your dealership were affected. So, you know, the worst thing that can ever happen to a car dealership is your DMS fails. And exactly what happened was, is that we were not able to do a car deal or write a repair order or do any banking of any kind. Normally these things happen where you have a, a power outage, or if you have a, you know, a, um, a internet line that gets cut, you're off for a couple hours, no big deal, even 24 hours. But when you're on day two, you realize, and no information, we realize that we are in a serious situation where we go into, okay, we have to have communication with all of our employees, and how are we going to get through this? So all of a sudden, do we have handwritten ROs? How do we make car deals legal? How do we keep our ROs legal? And best of all, or the worst thing of all, is how do we keep all our employees happy and moving forward? And what we did at the Nilo company is one is that we had daily updates with our team members. So our parts and service managers, we had a daily event where we talked about best practices as we find out from our great third party people that how do we make things work? How do we do tech inspections and videos? How do we send quotes or make quotes? How does the parts department bill out parts or even give us quotes on parts as we talk through those systems through the time of the shutdown? By, the, by day three, day four, we're getting pretty good at it, <laughs> you know? And uh, it was like pretty scary. We ran out of repair orders. We had to find an emergency repair order. So the call for us was, is having this was a huge wake up call for the Nilo company. Are we prepared for a disaster? We feel we're prepared for a lot of things with great partners like we have here today. The goal is, is that are we prepared for long term shutdown? And we were, I would say, not that prepared for it. But at the end, our employees succeeded all of our expectations. Our customers really rarely see that we had a serious problem and move forward. Sean Kingry, um, there were a lot of unknowns during that time. We didn't know how long this would last. Uh, the first couple hours, um, and then it led on to first couple days, if you would, Sean, your experience. It did, Ted, and thank you. You know, it's it's funny. I'm gonna I'm gonna feed a lot of actually what Tully said, and and where he says by day two and day three, he was up and running. Well, we weren't. And I'm and and I've owned a lot of that too. By the way, you talk about a learning experience. There were so many things that we could have done better, and I think a lot of that came from. And I know we've all talked about it. The communication. We talked about culture. We talk about communication, and I think the lack of communication or the unknown communication was the killer here because we were all anticipating, well, there's no way this can last longer than a day or to Tully's point, 24 hours when the internet line gets cut or you go into day two, you're going to come in the morning, it's going to be okay. And then the false rumors, you know, of all the Facebook posts are, oh, hey, this store's up or this store's up. And you're thinking, well, if there's a, if there's a dealership in Georgia that's up or if Tully's up in Sacramento, that must mean we're coming up. So you, you keep taking baby steps when realistically by day three, we were done taking baby steps. And by that point, we were in the baby carriage full speed. And to Tully's point, we didn't have, an, you know, we have eight stores. You know, we have one store that writes 350 ROs a day. We didn't have those ROs ready to go. So you're ordering Amazon overnight, which, by the way, you better hit click in a hurry because everybody was doing the same things. So, and to Tully's point, where we are today versus where we were, because I think everybody agrees, and hopefully Nicole and, and, and Brad can share more insight onto this of what happened and why it happened. Now we think is that when is it going to happen again? Because if it happened once, I think we all understand that. And listen, Tully and I and Ted, we've all done panels before where I think Tully's been hit dealership wide, okay, in his own group. Guys, it's only a matter of time before we run into the same situation again. Will we handle it differently? 
much differently next time. Nikhil, a lot of people in the industry, particularly at dealerships, are wondering, how does something like this happen? Well, we don't have the specifics of the attack in the summer. We don't know that firsthand, but I can I can tell you how it generally happens. So generally speaking, almost every single attack begins via email. Over 90% begin as a phishing email. Now, if, if education at the dealership is very strong, hopefully those emails don't get clicked on, right? But invariably, some do. The next stage of it is the bad guys then install local malware on one PC. So that gives them a, a single foothold or a vantage point into that network. From there, they'll grow further. It's called lateral movement, where they're looking for how wide can we go? Uh, what are the crown jewels? What can we find about this business that will inflict pain? Right? Can we find critical infrastructure? Can we find their backups so that they cannot recover? So it's very important as you go through this to understand your network architecture know where your critical uh, infrastructure is and protect that. But good tools, good processes, good monitoring can stop these kinds of things. Brad, speak to us about detection and uh, response. Oh yeah, so you know if you've got the right tools, the right things in place, you can drastically limit the exposure points. You know, my, my policy is if we can make this a 15 minute event for a single person, so your F&I manager, your service advisor, clicks on something, downloads it, shouldn't have downloaded that, but you've got the right tools in place that stop it right there. It alerts your monitoring team. The team looks at it, says, oh, yeah, that's bad. We're going to kill that. Boom. It's done. 15 minutes later, he's back to work. He's writing his next RO, doing his next finance deal. Everybody's forgotten about it by dinner time. All right. That's that's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is you're, you don't see it at that point. So it starts to move laterally. It starts escalating. So it's, it uses what's called privilege escalation, which means that uh, it, it started as a user. Now it's an administrator. So it's going to move all over, take over the network, and then usually on maybe a Sunday night, two in the morning, something like that, it's going to launch the full attack. And you know, when you come in, every single device doesn't work, uh, servers, data, everything's everything's wiped out. You know, the attackers that are doing this are not, you know, it's not a guy in a hoodie sitting in his mom's basement ordering pizza. All right, I mean, these are, these are well-funded, well-established teams. Uh, we know most of them are in Russia. Uh, we know this because a lot of their tools actually turns off. They will self-destruct if they detect the Russian keyboard active or if they have an IP address coming out of Russia. All right, so it's well known. We, we know who these guys are. We know where they are. We can't do anything about it. But they're well-funded. They're, they're making hundreds of millions of dollars you know, every year. And they're using that money, reinvesting it, going after you know everything from mom and pop buy here, pay here to you know the big uh, publics and everything in between, as we've seen. So, Brad, you're the founder of Proton. Um, I know you see a lot of threats, okay? What have you been, and I imagine you were very busy for most of the summer. Um, what have you been seeing since the incident? Very busy most of the summer. That's gotta be the most significant understatement that I can think of uh, in quite some time. Yes, very busy would be the word. Um, everything from, you know, talking with dealers at uh, midnight, 1 a.m., trying to figure out, you know, how to take Tully and Sean's you know, ideas of what they're doing and figure out, you know, how to create better ways of doing processes to get back to work the next day. You know, to, to trying to identify, you know, is there a threat to our dealerships, you know, from this cyber attack? Is there something that could could convey out of that and get back into our dealerships? And that's, that's something we hadn't really looked a whole lot at historically. And that's kind of the one thing we learned, I think, taken away from this is we're now looking. We have always looked at hardening the environment in the dealership from, you know, external threats. But there's a there's a lot of you know companies that work with automotive players, you know, such as your DMS that have a direct connection. And. And so now we've looked at, you know, just about every aspect of how do we make sure that even, even your partners are secure, you know, just, just because they file an FTC report that says they're secure, let's doesn't necessarily mean they are, you know, to the best extent that we'd like them to be. So I think we've taken a far more aggressive approach in looking at those things and then, you know, helping dealers build out, you know, to Tully and Sean both, you know, incident response plans. If something goes wrong and it's not just, you know, a tornado strikes nearby or we lose power for a day, you know, let's talk about what everything is that could go wrong. And kind of, I think there's been so much more interest in dealers in really thinking through all of that. You know, what happens if we get hit by ransomware? What happens if a partner gets hit? What happens if, you know, our entire internet goes down for a month? I mean, just anything you can think of, you know, it, and I get the question you know, a lot during the, this event was, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that's happened is it doesn't come back. So, you know, when you think about something like that, that there is a catastrophic, 
you know, ending to some of these things, you've really got to start thinking about, you know, what are you doing now? And, and what do you need to be doing to make sure that you do have plans in place for a malware attack, for a phishing attack, or for an industry partner attack? Brad, you and I have been on panels before with dealers uh, who have turned to you, okay, have come to Proton, okay, to help them. Uh, what are some of the most prevalent kinds of cyber attacks that, uh, that you're seeing? The two biggest ones we're seeing are, you know, obviously the, the ransomware attacks. Uh, we see those because they're extremely financially lucrative. Like I said, the guys are making hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they're making hundred million in a month. Uh, so you know, that that attack can be done using automated tools and AI. You know, historically, that attack would be someone creating a phishing email, sending it out, you know, a million times. Well, by the time it gets out, maybe 50, 50 100, 200 times, the spam filters start to see it and start to recognize, all right, this email is probably spam, and then they spread the word and it gets blocked. With the newer tools using AI. Now they're actually generating unique emails. So they might send out out of a million emails, that's 100,000 unique emails that they're sending out 10 times. So it really makes it much harder to detect. And then the malware that's being sent out is actually a lot of times altered on the fly as well, using AI altering the code so that every time it gets installed, it's totally unique. Nobody's seen it before. So we're seeing a lot more aggressive attacks. Uh, we've definitely seen a big uptick uh, just since the summer. You know, We're seeing that the, the automotive industry is now on the radar a lot more than I think it was previously. Uh, you know, the scammers and hackers realize that there's a, a lot of money in this industry and they want some, so they're gonna come get it. Um, you know, and if, if they're, you know, if you are the the hardened bank and somebody else is the bank with the front doors open, then you're probably gonna, you know, be the one that survives and they're gonna move on to the next one that's got the front doors open. Uh, but, you know, ransomware and business email compromise is the other one we're seeing a lot of, which is where they're intercepting email, creating man in the middle conversations, and defrauding dealers through wire transfers, taking customer payments, things like that. Uh, we've seen them up to eight hundred thousand dollars in losses at a time uh, from some of those. Doesn't you know? Not as 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 fancy and doesn't get as much attention as a lot of the ransomware headlines. But but both of them are very lucrative uh, for the scammers and hackers. And but Nikhil, saw... this happened. This happened on a big scale this summer. Ab big, bigger than we thought possible. Absolutely. So you know, Brad talked about uh, a very busy summer. So what we saw on the technical front was a 350% increase in attacks on dealerships. Our tools say that, so that's mathematical fact. It was a huge uptick in activity. So our monitoring staff was on it constantly, uh, really working hard to make sure that we are coming out clean through that, and we did. So a uh, huge increase in that respect. The other major part, the business email compromise, and not as much, um, not as well talked about, but those losses really do add up and that's gone up as well. Stunning, okay, to hear that this could happen. And uh, Nikhil, the uncertainty that Tully and Sean spoke about, uh, just magnify that by thousands, tens of thousands of of dealers and managers and dealership. And, uh, you know, this really has had a, a, a massive effect. And Nikhil, it's opened a lot of eyes, okay, uh, to what could happen. Brad, um, I've had many a conversation with uh, Tully, uh, who's on this panel, and he's out in California, and uh, I know they've been really prepared. Okay, but um, you know, like you said, these are these are big enterprises uh, who are maybe a couple of steps ahead of all of us in this game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's an enemy that is getting you know far more advanced. Uh, they're using the latest tools. They're getting far more aggressive, and they're seeing amazing return on investment. I mean, you know, the, the amount of it costs them to send out phishing email is nothing. They're using a compromised email server. It literally costs them absolutely nothing. And all they need is, you know, one out of, you know, 100,000, 100, one out of a million people to click on anything. And that gets them the foothold in there. And then they can move laterally and then they can just start, you know, locking things up. And, you know, we've seen it in, in the casinos out in Vegas. You know, it's the same guys that are doing the casinos that are also doing the automotive industry. Right. So it's not like, you know it's it's just a specific attacker it's the guys that are doing all the you know the big things are also doing automotive that's just on their radar so it's coming for you you know the best thing you can do is to harden up everything and, and to get multiple opinions so you know i talked to a dealer that uh, came back from a 20 group heard about a ransomware event you know because ransomware is kind of like the big secret in the automotive world it's something you talk about at 20 groups behind closed doors after two drinks right but it's not something anybody wants to talk about otherwise so it's just this this big secret that I hear about because I get I'm the one that gets called for 
you know, so and so got my number from so and so at a 20 group. We're in the middle of a ransomware event. Can you help us? So we, we've seen a lot of them. They're constant. And if you don't have the right tools and the right things and procedures in place, it doesn't work well. So I got referred into a group that was 20 plus stores. They had a ransomware event. They had the right tools, but nobody was actually monitoring it. It wasn't set up. And all it would do is send an email to a guy who wasn't checking his inbox. And so it got in, it moved laterally, shut them all down, massive ransomware event. Had another one on the East Coast that had all the wrong tools. They had been sold by a company that's, that's actually fairly prominent in the automotive world. Uh, you know, that, hey, this tool works great. Well, guess what? That tool is junk. It's garbage. It doesn't do anything. All right. So it they had been fully ransomed and their security software never detected anything. It was showing like a green dashboard. Hey, everything is great. Have a nice day. Except that you can't use your computers. So, you know, you've got to make sure you've got the right tools and the right people monitoring that platform. And it's hard to know for a dealer, you know, what that means. So I would suggest, you know, talk to your CPA firms. They do audits. Talk to some other groups. Get third-party assessments. Kind of make sure that whatever your IT guy or whatever your, you know, whoever handles this for you is telling you adds up and checks out. All right, you've got to do the due diligence. You've got to become somewhat of a knowledgeable individual on this. You can't just say, hey, you know, my cousin's nephew's uncle does IT. His name's Bob. And so we got Bob's PCs and he's in here, you know, every quarter. And so we're good because he told me we're good. All right. That's that's not an acceptable answer nowadays. So you've got to do the due diligence. All right. So Tully and Sean, let me um, bring you in. Uh, a lot of folks have questions. A lot of retail people have questions at this point. Tully, what's uh, something you want to ask in terms of how dealers or even maybe your vendors and partners can protect themselves? Tully first and then Sean. Uh, direct your questions to Nikhil and, and Brad. So I think that when we look at what we see out there today, I think dealerships do not understand how important IT security is. Norton security doesn't work, right? And just like Brad said, you know, somebody's uncle's aunt's cousin's first person, it doesn't work anymore. And if you're not monitoring on a daily basis. So when I look at protection from a dealership level, one, the most important is training of your employees. Are they scared? Yes, they should be scared. And secondly, is you have to have the right partner that knows automotive, as we are here with Proton today. If they do not know automotive, you're in deep trouble because we are a unique business. So the question comes out is, how do we, as a dealership, make sure that our employees know what's going on too? And then how do we test them to make sure that we don't have problems? Because phishing emails happen to us on an hourly basis. And I think that when you look at software, how does software help our employees from making the wrong mistake? So, Tali, quality really matters, right? You can provide education, but it must be the right quality of education. It needs to engage the user, and culture really matters. Because even if you provide good classes, but the, the employees aren't, aren't held accountable for taking those, and the culture is not there, the mission will fail. So having the culture from the top, recognizing the, the intensity of the threat, teaching your staff, and testing your staff is very important. What we do is we test at least weekly. Every single employee gets minimum a weekly test for phishing. And those who fail, they are held accountable for that. It's a very strong culture of security. Uh, yeah, the, the other piece is, is continuous because you have so much turnover with, you know, in the automotive space. It's just a part of our business is there's a lot of turnover. You know, it, the people that you have trained are gone. And then the people that you, know, you bring in, you've got to make sure that they accept that culture and that they get you know trained immediately and and that the whole defensive posture is passed down to, to all the new employees as they come on board it's got to be part of your onboarding that they just automatically into that that you know concept i think that when you when the training piece and i love that you said that i think that's the most important piece and they be held accountable because as that word spreads the first couple times you fail the test yeah whatever but now when you're talking about that on a weekly and a monthly basis and when you have your reviews at your stores and you talk about the security risk. Now, what happens, our employees turn into our best defense, where they say, hey, we got this email. And I, they're afraid to open anything, which is the best thing we can ever have. You know what? We'd rather be overcautious than undercautious. So I love that you do the training. I love it on a weekly basis. I think that's a great idea. And we actually have employees that are dedicated to just basically answering all these emails that come in. Is this a phishing email? 
because we get hundreds and hundreds of days that come in and says, Hey, is this a phishing email? Should I open this? Should I open this? And we're, we're, we're glad. It's like, we would much rather, you know, take the time and, and see that than just clicking blindly on anything and everything. And then going, Hey, you know, I think I probably shouldn't have clicked on that. And I mean, it is what it is, but, but definitely. But invariably, have invariably some percentage of email does get clicked. Right. So coming back to the statement about quality, the tools on the machine are critically important. So how can a dealer know if they're buying quality or not? One easy way is to look up the specific tools. So there's a ratings agency called Gartner, and they rate various kinds of software, various IT infrastructure. The Gartner magic quadrant for endpoint detection and response, that's a long term. But if one was to Google that, okay. you will see that they have rated the vendors in the field uh, and using uh, a software from the magic quadrant, which is the best quadrant that they have, does make a difference. Yep. If it's not there, throw it away. So the last thing I would like to ask is, how are we dealing with third-party leads that come through, especially for our sales side, where a lead comes in through a third party, which is not through email, so all that protection is gone, and then we have a salesperson say, oh, my God, I think I got a car deal, and clicks the button. So that's a tricky one because it does go directly into your CRM, right? So that's, yeah. it bypasses all the security folks. And we've seen a lot of that in the last six months to a year. Yes. We've seen tons of, you know, not just uh, attempts to, to do phishing and malware, but also to do bank fraud. We've seen so many deals come in that way and it bypasses, you know, just about every cybersecurity tool out there. So I think, you know, putting pressure on the CRMs to be accountable for that, to actually build and incorporate, uh, you know, filtering platforms into their, their, their lead process. Uh, that's going to make a huge difference. Now there, there are some more complex ways. So for instance, you know, when you run your, when you go to audit trader and you put the email, you know, feed in there, instead of putting it directly to your CRM, you can actually put it to your own email server. And then from there forward it to the CRM. So there is a way you can run it through your own filter, your own spam filter. I just blew Tully's mind. Look at that. Boom. Right there. It's worth being on the round table. So you can run it through your own filter, your own server, and then direct it back. So you'll still, you'll keep all the, the, the metadata that comes from auto trader. They'll know where it came from and you'll, you'll, you'll get the benefit. It's a little more complex, but it'll, it'll add that extra feature to it. In the meantime, I push the CRMs and, you know, make lots of calls to your CRMs to, to hold them accountable. Yeah. There's one more strategy, Tully. It's on the outbound traffic side. So every time we click a link, we're translating that link into what is called an IP address, which is the technical address of the destination. There are tools that can filter for known bad IP addresses. So link can look like any text. But if you've got uh, a good DNS filter, a DNS is the translation mechanism from the link to the address. A good DNS filter could potentially stop the outbound side of the communication and mitigate those attacks. Yeah, good point. Sean Kingry, um, we're under attack. You as well up there in uh, in Wisconsin. In sunny, yes, sunny Madison, Wisconsin. So, you know, I'm going to go off of because because Tully kind of kind of stole some of the question. One thing I took out of Tully's comment though, we are in a unique business, and and when this cyber attack happened, I think the one thing that came out to outside of the mortgage business, think of what our DMS holds. Everything of our customers' information, their social security number, their job, their credit report, everything you want to know is there. And when we got attacked, everybody now wonders if you're, you're vulnerable. And the, the, you're talking about the phishing, the emails. And I'm going to take that a step further, Brad, on your on your half. You know, the, the UPS has a package for you or the FedEx has a package for you. Those emails we're all getting every day. Our staff is smart enough to start to figure them out, okay? But I guess my question really is for, is, is, is for Brad. Is there a process checklist? I'm a big process guy. I want to know that all eight stores that I have or 20 stores and four, whatever the case is, or Tully's group, is there a process? Is there a written checklist that we can make sure, for example, like when this happened now, I now have a process that if I walk if, if, if I walk in in the morning and my DMS is down, we're going to do this, this, and this, whether it's one hour, one day, one month, we have a process. Is there a checklist that, that can be put out that, should everybody check every day to make sure that they're following every single step to so we can prevent this from happening internally, not even globally, but internally? Because, again, is it a difference if it's a DMS or if it's our own system? Either way, we're crippled. We're not selling parts. We're not selling cars, which means we're not making any money. Yeah, I mean, it's basically an incident response plan or a disaster recovery plan is kind of what you're talking about. And those can be as detailed as, you know, extensive 50 page documents or as simple as, you know, five or eight you know, checklist items. 
So, you know, building those out and, you know, getting your staff to review them on a regular basis, you know, I think is, is exactly what you're talking about and kind of being prepared and thinking through it, even doing tabletop exercises, you know, okay, you know, what, what happens this month? Well, we, you know, we got hit by a hurricane. What are we going to do? And, you know, kind of having all your managers come in and sit down for 30 minutes and say, okay, what are we going to do? And, or, you know, just, we got hit by ransomware. We got hit by this, whatever. This is down. How are we going to handle it? And keeping that fresh, you know, making it a part of your culture. So at least, you know, once a month, once a quarter, you're kind of talking through that, what that would look like, I think makes all the difference. All right. So gentlemen, to close today for our audience at the Fixed Ops Roundtable, folks in the fixed operations side of the business, as we come towards the end of the year now, and now we're a couple months from this attack that's happened, uh, Nikel, I'll come to you first and then Brad to bring it home. What are some safeguards that um, if you just had 30 seconds or so to talk to the dealer audience that you recommend that they focus on between now and let's say the end of the year. And then uh, Brad, I'll come to you on that as well. And then how our audience can take some next steps to be proactive. Sure. I'd say two broad things, uh, Ted. The first is take care of the culture and the education aspect at the dealership. Make sure that that's being done well. The second part is to not confuse compliance with security. They are separate things. Right. Compliance is a demonstration of your security. That's one way to define it. But security is a technical function. It should be done by a technical team. And, and don't mix those two. The other one to not mix is don't mix IT and security. Right. They are also separate. They are related, of course. Both are technical functions. But there's that, that structure, a good IT, good security on top of that, and then compliance can wrap that all up and demonstrate your, your good effort in that respect. Excellent. And uh, Brad Holton. I would say, you know, right tools, right services, right people in the right places. You know, putting putting the right people to oversee everything you're doing, making sure that you know, you've got the right eyes on it, and then right, having the right products, the right security tools, and the right services backing up that. That's what hardens the environment. That, that's, what, that's what stops these kind of things. If you don't have any of that, good luck. Brad, if our audience wants to be proactive and reach out and take next steps, uh, what do you recommend? Uh, how do they do that? And uh, uh, how do they find out how they can protect themselves? Uh, they can reach out to us, uh, Proton Dealership IT, ProtonTechs.com. It's on the bottom of the screen. Uh, happy to help out. Free advice, consulting, all they want. I mean, we just, we're happy to help out any way we can. We, we've seen what dealers have been through. We don't want anybody to go through that. So anything we can do to help, we're happy to chat anytime. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you for your contributions, your great contributions to the industry. Tully Williams at the Nilo Company, Sean Kingry at Kaiser Automotive, uh, Nikhil Kalani, uh, Vice President, Chief Information Officer at the Reynolds and Reynolds Company, uh, hard at work, okay, on helping dealers protect and defend themselves. And Brad Holton with us here today. Uh, Brad is the founder of uh, Proton uh, Dealership IT, Cybersecurity. Uh, best in the business. Uh, gentlemen, on behalf of the Fixed Ops Roundtable, thank you and uh, look forward to checking in with you uh, in the future uh, to learn on the latest best practices and how we can protect ourselves. Sure. Thank you for having us, Ted. Everybody, the Proton panel here with us today at the Fixed Ops Roundtable.